Well, good morning. It's so good to be here um, as we continue our study of the book of James. Uh, it's a, such a good book, such a challenge to us as believers. We talked about it in the past, having the same genre almost as Proverbs. It's a book of wisdom. And there's a lot of comparison. The last time I was here, uh, two weeks ago, I preached on trials versus temptations. And we talked about how you handled it was dependent upon the worldview that you had. To handle it by, as a Christian, we would see the trials as a gift from God to prune us, to make us more like Him. If we looked at it through the flesh and handled it according to the flesh, then we started feeding our lusts, our passions, and it led into sin. We saw that God only gives a good and perfect gift. The flesh is what causes sin. Well, my task this morning is James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And my topic, and we could go on a lot of rabbit trails, so I've got my notes home so I don't. I've titled this message, The Sin of Partiality. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We pray, Father, for those who are in this room that might not know you, that they would come to your saving grace. For those who are struggling, we pray that they would be assured through your promises and through the words that would be spoken today. I ask you to use me, that the word spoken would be yours, not mine. And may you be honored and receive glory, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. For us first to deal and get an understanding of the sin of partiality, it's important that we know what impartiality is, what it is. So I have here impartiality is the quality of not being biased or prejudiced. It's fairness, with fairness being defined as a state, condition, or quality of being fair or free from bias or injustice. Fair being defined as free from bias, dishonesty, or injustice. With that definition right there, I could ask you, can we be impartial? And the answer would be no. There is only one who is impartial, and that is God himself who is sovereign. He is the one that we are to imitate. He is the one that we are to be like, because a part of him, apart from him, we cannot be impartial. There's only one, God. Now, in order to understand impartial, impartiality, we've got to look at who God is. We know that God is spirit. We know there are three in one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But God the Father is a spirit. And he encompasses everything at the same time. He is holy, he is righteous, he is just, he is fair, he is equitable, he is love, he is mercy, he is judgment. That is not compartmentalized. That is who he is. We also know that God is immutable. He cannot change. Why? Because it's not his nature. So he is of that. And how does he demonstrate his impartiality? Deuteronomy 10, 17 says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and awesome, God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. That tells you you can't work a deal with God. That tells you you can't work a, a side deal saying, Well, you know, God, if you give this to me, I'll do this for you. He can't do that because that's not his nature. He is not a man. 2 Chronicles 9, 17 now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do, for the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or taking of a bride. Not only do we find out he won't take a bride, he will have nothing to do with those who will. He cannot be there. Job 34, 19. God, who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich above the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. Romans 10, 12. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. 
I can summarize all this in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. From this alone, we see that what he does is impartial. He, he deals the same with the human race. Man. He deals the same regardless of your gender. And there are only two genders, by the way. And he deals with you regardless of your ethnicity. Listen, God doesn't care if you're tall, short, fat, thin, whatever ethnic part you are. He doesn't care about that. He's impartial to that. How do I know? Because the Bible says, all who sin will perish. Whether you're male, female, black, white. If you're a part of the human race and you sin and you don't repent, we, they face the same judgment. If you are born again, you have heaven. So he's not impartial. The wages of sin is death. You don't repent, you die. And then when you die, you find out you really don't die in regards to the end, but you step into your eternal life. Whether it's in the lake of fire, or if you get heaven, to that glorious time we're with God in the, in the new heavens and the new earth. You see, death or heaven right now is just our intermediate state where we're waiting to have our glorified bodies. Heaven is not the end goal. The end goal is the new heavens and the new earth. But God is impartial. He doesn't care what you look like. He doesn't care what family you come from. He doesn't care how rich, how poor. If you sin and don't repent, you go to hell. If you repent, you go to heaven. That means you can be poor, downtrodden, illegitimate, have bad family life. You can have all the bad things in the world, but if you repent and put your trust in Christ, he's impartial, you go to heaven. That's how impartial our God, our Father, is in heaven. Now, we're going to talk today on James 2 where he's talking to the church. But if you are up to date on any social media, you can see how the world has begun to influence and trying to creep in to the church. Today it's called critical race theory, it's called woke, it's called BLM, it's called liberation theology. When I was growing up, it was nature versus nurture and liberation theology. The world influence is trying to come into the church and if you look at some of the churches, you'll see it's come in. One of them I said is liberation theology. This is a concept of sin. Um, let me read this right. Liberation theology is the theological concept of sin as it is expressed in Latin American theology over and against the more traditional understanding of sin in Western Christianity. The domination of others and the oppression of the poor through geopolitical systems of power. Nothing in there about Christ. Nothing in there about God. It's about human fairness, freeing the oppressed, human salvation through works. And there are four ideas that have been central to this movement. And this is coming from John Allen, believe it or not, National Catholic reporter on, the, on an article called Key Principles of Liberation Theology. Number one, the preferential option for the poor. Now, I want you to understand that. What they're saying is to get impartiality, we've got to be partial. We've got to focus on the poor, make them partial, and deal with the others to make it equitable. There is no impartiality in that. For the liberation theologians, this means that the church must align itself with poor as they demand justice. Do you see that? Who is man to demand justice? We are, in, we are partial in our justice. God is not. Number two, institutional violence. 
Liberation is see a, hid, see a hidden violence and social arrangement that create hunger and poverty. In other words, they're complaining because a sinful world is behaving as a sinful world would do. And some are getting rich, some are starving, some are oppressed, some are rich. That is the world of, of sin. That is the nature of the carnal man. That is the world being run by the God of this age. You can't have impartiality. Number three, structural sin. Liberation theologians argue that there's a social dimension that is more than the sum of individual acts. And they talk about the feudal nature of relationship, colonism. Again, man's sin creates man's inequity and man who is sinful wants to fix this inequity through sinful means, covered by light. Doesn't make sense. Number four is orthopraxis. The term was coined by the liberation theologians as a counterpoint to insistence on orthodoxy, meaning correct belief. They don't want correct belief. Correct belief means you trust the gospel and as individuals you serve the Lord, you meet the needs, but the emphasis is on the gospel. Liberation theology accomplishes its means by compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nay, at times it, it invalidates the gospel of salvation in order for the accomplishment of equality. To accomplish this, many liberations theologians were drawn to Marxism. Critics found this alarming, insisting that one cannot distinguish between Marx, Marxist science and its ideological underpinnings. Atheism, materialism, and totalitarianism. That's where we are today in the world. Now, there's a second influence coming in the church, and this one is, I would say, a little more pervasive because now if, if you are against it, you are a racist, and if you're white, you're the problem, and that is called woke. Woke is now defined in, this dic as, in the dictionary as aware of and actively attentive to important facts and issues, especially issues of racial and social justice. In other words, being woke is an identity religion. Now, I want to share something with you that's going to be very short because I know what this is like. And to just give you a little bit, because I grew up with that mentality. Matter of fact, my relationship with Cindy was affected because she came from a, a middle class white home that had great values and great family. I'm an illegitimate child that my mom left. I was li raised in a Hispanic home, lived in those neighborhoods where we were not treated so kindly. So I understand that. But as we take this to where the natural result is, I want to tell you something. It's real. And it fills in the gaps for those who are unbelievers because it gives you a worth, it gives you something to fight for. But the reality is, it is a lie. When you come to Jesus Christ, you have been reconciled to God. You are one with God. There's no more need for justice and equity. I have been given something that is beyond what I deserve, which is heaven. The big issue, and we're going to talk about that when we get into it. The big issue is how the church, the church, responds to each other who are different. We are to love one another. You want to be impartial in the church? Don't say that we want a black church. Don't say that we want a white church. Don't say we want a Hispanic church. I understand the cultural means, but what we should say is we want Christ's church. We want Christ's church because Christ will bring them in. And then it is up to us, up to us through sanctification, to be able to love one another, get along with one another, respect one another's culture, and we need to understand that each and every one of us who are minorities or none, we're getting a culture war here because our flesh is saying no, but God's spirit says yes, I'm impartial. 
You see, personally for me, I'm convinced the problem we have within the church, when you have people saying, I, I, I want a black church or we want to enter, the problem we have is not the fact of the color of skin, it's the way we each worship in church. If you've ever worshiped in a black church, it's lively. If you've ever wor worshiped in an Anglican church, it's cold. If you have been there. The reality is, for us to be impartial and growing in that, is to understand, if my sister next to me wants to dance and shout and run through the pews as long as it's scriptural, I'm going to let her worship God. Okay? If my friend on the left wants to get on his knees at the, uh, in the pew in front of him and pray and worship as we sing, I'm not going to think there's something wrong with him. He's worshiping. We're going to get a big surprise in heaven when we find out people don't worship the same. That we're all worshiping the same God, but by who we are. So woke. So impartiality, apart from God, centers on self-righteousness of an individual, or self-righteousness and a democracy within a church. Which brings us back to partiality. A church does not have a democracy. Do we understand that? This is not a business. We're not CEOs. We don't run this according to structure other than what scripture says. We believe in the regulative principles of the Bible, which means what the Bible teaches we do, we can do. And what it says, if it doesn't say we can't do it and it's within binds, we worship. But this is not a democracy. If you come in here with a democratic mind, you forgot one thing. God does not have a democracy. He is God. He is sovereign. He is absolute. It's his way. If you come into church and your attitude was well, going to be my way or the highway, you might as well pack your bags because we're not going to try to put God underneath you. God is over us and we have to honor him. We have to rever him. We have to respect who he is. Now, having said all that, we also have to know that partiality itself defined is unfair bias in favor of one thing or person compared with another. It is favoritism. Favoritism. Now with that in mind, let's read James chapter 2, 1 through 13. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and you say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not, not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but, you, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I want us to look at four things. We're going to look at number one, the command. Number two, we're going to look at partiality defined. Number three, partiality described. And four, partiality condemned. Let's look at the command. That's in 1A. My brethren... Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ 
with an attitude of personal favoritism. Notice he is talking to the church. He is talking to the church. Even when he's saying the negative things, he is not talking about the world. He is talking about what's going on within the church. And what he's saying here is, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Christ with an attitude of personal. Don't think that you are somebody special because God saved you. Don't look at others as if they're below you because I'm special. God saved me. We need to remember it was nothing that we did. God's impartiality, God's election, God's decision, God's choosing, he chose us. Because I can tell you from the one behind the pulpit, I would have never chosen me for salvation. I no way, no how earned it. And it's, and it's in a way, it's blasphemy for me to think I am somebody special over someone who has not been saved. Or looking at a brother in the church as being beneath me because I am a better Christian than they are. It's not about us. It's about him. Once you can get that, your focus shift from self, self-desires, and passions. And it focuses on the purposes, plans, and desires of our Heavenly Father. My brethren, don't look at yourself special. Don't think you're favorite. Don't think you're special. That's what he's telling the church. That's what we need to tell the church today. One bumper sticker I used to hate. I knew what it meant, but it just seemed so arrogant. Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. That's true. But on your bumper sticker, that seems kind of arrogant. Because you say, I'm forgiven. You're not. You know, it's that... It's that special treatment we think that we deserve, that we should have. And before I get, even with you thinking your favorite, Luke 17, 10 has a very good humbling verse in it. That is, when you have done all that you are supposed to do, guess what God says? You're still an unprofitable servant because that's what you were supposed to do. Don't risk, expect a reward or accolades for being who you are supposed to be in Christ. Now let's look at partiality defined. Number two, 1B. It says, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now, that attitude of personal favoritism, that phrase, prosopolemisia in Greek means lifting up someone's face with the idea of judging by appearance and on that basis giving special favor and respect. It pertains to judging purely on a superficial level without consideration of a person's true merit, abilities, or character. We need to remember Matthew 7 talks about self-righteous judgment. We're not to judge on self-righteousness. Listen. I don't think we understand or are aware of the times we do self-righteous judgment. If someone comes into this church, and I mean, they come into this church, they want to hear the gospel, but they're not like us. Do you have an aversion for them sitting next to you? Are you critical of the way you think Christians should be? Are you critical of the way you think Christians should dress? Are you critical of the way Christians are behaving themselves in, in the church that look different than you? That's partiality. That's partiality. I remember one time on, on, on when we were out doing street preaching, we used to be involved in it. I heard a man yell across a quadrant to a man walking with his wife. She wasn't dressed too mo what we would call modestly. But this is the words out of his mouth. Sir, did you know your wife is dressed like a whore and she's causing men to lust? And you say, how atrocious, how could you do that? Do you know what it's like if you walk up into a church, and I'll, I'll bring this, and you don't have very much clothes, or you may not have shoes, or you may not have long pants, and someone comes up to you and says, you really can't be a Christian, look how you're dressed. That's partiality. 
You have just put yourself in the place of God making a judgment. And what do we know about God? The Lord said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance. Flesh looks at flesh. But the Lord looks at the heart. We're reminded in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And we say, yes, yes, I know that. But here's a caveat. Such were some of you. Do you hear that? Such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Don't judge the book by the cover. Because God judges from the contents out. And sooner or later, as you are growing in Christ, the outward will begin to blossom like a flower because of what is inside of you. Now let's look at partiality described in verses 2 through 5. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and you say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Listen, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who who love him. In these verses, we see the sin of partiality demonstrated in making personal distinctions among ourselves and becoming judge with evil motives. We go back to Matthew 7. Judge not lest you be judged, for by the measure you judge, you too will also be judged. You judge self-righteously, you're going to be judged self-righteously. You judge, if you are judged by the righteousness of God, guess what? Everybody is being judged by the righteousness of God in the same way. We have to learn to get off the throne. We have to learn to not be idolaters worshiping ourselves, putting us above God. Therefore, we make the decisions on who does what, what they do, and if, it does, if they do it the way we think it should be done. We shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be doing it. It's a sin. Now the poor man that they reference here refers to one who has few or no possessions but has not yet reduced the begging. We're looking at a socioeconomic status here. He doesn't have the big house on the hill. He may live in a chicken coop. He's not begging. He's got some. But in the church, the church, remember we're talking to believers, the church we give preference to those who can give money. We give preference to those who look good. Who were not physically ashamed of us admitting that they're a part of our congregation. That's wrong. Again, such were some of you. But you were washed. You were cleansed. Now that word oppress... Dishonored the poor man, 6a, they, they, they dishonored him. Uh, oppressed means to tyrannize, to exit, uh, exercise, inordate, inordate power over others. To rule them. Rich people in the church deciding what the church should do. How the church should be run. And if they don't like it, then those people need to leave. Because we financially support the church. The church will do what we say or the church is going to go belly up. Let me tell you, my friends, this is a church of God through Jesus Christ. God adds to the number. God takes away. And if you're that arrogant to think your money is going to sustain the church, you need to repent. God is in control of this church. They gathered together, breaking bread, doing the apostles' teaching, 
just being obedient, just being faithful. And God added to their number every day. Partiality in a church, you end up welcoming tares. And pretty soon the tares outnumber the wheat. And you have a dead church. You have a church that's politically correct. Socially acceptable. Because you have shown tolerance. And I will tell you again my favorite phrase from G.K. Chesterton. Tolerance is a virtue for those lacking conviction. We want to be accepted. We want to be a church that everybody loves. We want to be a church that everybody wants to come to. I don't. I want to be a church where we feed the saints. I want to be a church where the saints are fed and they go out and share the gospel. And then we allow God to add to these numbers. The day comes when we want to be socially accepted. Means that we have to let Christ go. Because when Christ is impartial. He doesn't care who you are. If you sin, you're going to hell. If you repent, you're going to heaven. What we do is we try to say, well, you know, I don't really know if that's true. I may believe that, but you know, God is so kind and so merciful that I don't think he would send someone like you to hell. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It says you blaspheme the fair name. Listen, the fair name refers to Jesus by whom you were called. To treat people in partiality, you blaspheme the fair name of Jesus Christ, who was impartial. Now we look at B, it also commits sin in 9a. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. Now, when James is talking about sin in these passages, he is speaking of two forms of sin. Harmatia, which simply means sin, and parabates, which means someone who willfully, listen, willfully goes beyond God's prescribed limits. In one case, a person may come just short, or in another, he may go too much. Both are sinful, just as adding or subtracting from God's revealed word is sinful. See, you're convicted by the law as transgressors. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Let's look at the royal law. First, the word royal carries the idea of supreme and sovereign. The absolute and binding authority of the law. There is no appeal and there is no arbitration in this judgment with the law. The royal law, we just saw it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. You shall Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is the same. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Those two sum up the entire Ten Commandments in two. The divine law, the royal law. And what do we know about that? We know that if you break one law, you break them all. You can't say, well, yeah, I may have broken not loving my neighbor, but I haven't broken adultery. It doesn't matter. You break one, you break them all. Sin is transgression of the law. It's transgression of the law. Now, through this, we have no guilt, but we're convicted of our sin. Remember, he's talking to the church. You will go through discipline if you're showing partiality. You will, because whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. What does it say? My child, do not faint at the Lord's discipline. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. If he doesn't discipline, then you're illegitimate. So if you can continue in partiality and not get any judgment, my friend, you need to pray for salvation. But if you are a born-again believer and you're in this church and you are showing partiality, you should start feeling conviction. When you realize you have put yourself in the place of God making judgments of who is acceptable and unacceptable to you by your standards. Now, in these verses... We have seen that partiality is contrary to God's nature. God cannot be partial. He's impartial. 
It's inconsistent with the Christian faith. How do I know that? Because a Christian faith reflects the nature of God. Christian faith reflects the nature of God. And it's inconsistent with the purpose and plan of God choosing the poor of the world to be spiritually rich. Now, one thing we need to understand, too, when we're talking about the poor. Jesus made a statement. He said, the poor you will have with you always. Do you understand that? Not everybody is going to come out of poverty. When you came to salvation, when God saved you, when God saved me, he didn't save me to take me out of my physical situation. He saved me from the wrath of God. Okay? You can get saved and stay in the same neighborhood, in the same family conditions, until that changes naturally. That's what God purposed and planned and put you in. But he saves you while you're in it so that you can be changed and live a life that reflects opposite to what you're being introduced or what you're being habitually shown. So it's inconsistent to be partial because we are to reflect the nature of God. And it's inconsistent. Partiality is inconsistent with loving your neighbor as yourself. Do you realize when you put judgment on your neighbor, what you're saying is, I love me more than I love you. That's the reality of it. I love my money. I love my house. I love my socioeconomic status. I love that more than I love you. And you can hear Jesus. Why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? And they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You can't sit on the throne and disregard your brothers and sisters because you love yourself and really stand up to be a no Christian. That's against the nature of God. Now, we've seen that. Now, James concludes with an appeal to the brethren to not be partial. Again, he's talking to the church. He says, so speak, this is verse 12 and 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let me simplify. Live and act as a believer who has been saved by God's grace and will be judged on the basis of Christ's imputed righteousness. Live that way. You see, as a result of the righteousness imputed to us by Christ, we have been set free from the law of bondage and will now be judged under the law of liberty. God's mercy and God's grace, the gospel has set us free. And understand this, and this is more to the unbeliever if you're here in this room. Judgment will be merciless to the unbeliever. God is impartial in his judgment. When he says you will be cast into a, a, pay, a place of darkness where will be the wailing and gnashing of teeth. Or where the fire burns and the worm never dies. He is not kidding. You will suffer that as a result of judgment. Being merciful. God has said to us that we will be with him forever. That we will reign with him. That we will see him. That we will know those whom we've known here on earth who are believers. That we will love him and see him as he is. We will have a glorified body. We will be with him in the new heavens and new earth. And there will be no more tears. No more sorrow. And no more crying. Amen.